Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on your time zone. It is my absolute delight to welcome all of you to Financial Inclusion Week 2023. In case this is the first time that you join the event, Financial Inclusion Week is a platform designed to offer the global inclusive finance community an opportunity every year to share ideas, insights, and initiatives as we jointly work to advance inclusive financial services. The Center for Financial Inclusion is an independent think tank housed at Axion. We first launched Financial Inclusion Week in 2015, and we are very proud to continue the tradition now for the ninth year in a row. We absolutely value the opportunity to showcase, showcase our own work at CFI, as well as the work of thought leaders from around the world. We firmly believe that through this platform, and by partnering and collaborating more closely as a community, we can collectively become a lot more effective and a lot smarter at addressing the challenges that we are facing today. This year's theme asks the question, is inclusive finance ready for the accelerating pace of change? The past year has witnessed an incredible number of disruptions and rapid changes. Artificial intelligence, is quickly becoming part of every facet of financial services. Climate-related disasters um, are, and, and forced displacement are becoming more frequent and more unpredictable. If managed well, inclusive finance can help individuals and small businesses navigate these changes, and innovations could lead to more inclusion and positive impacts on people's lives. Before continuing, uh, with this session. I'd like to share a short welcome video with uh, all of you. Welcome to Financial Inclusion Week 2023. The Center for Financial Inclusion is excited to deliver an action-packed four days of rich content and healthy debate, featuring a range of voices and perspectives, all committed to the goal of a more inclusive financial system. Each year, Financial Inclusion Week provides an opportunity for organizations and individuals around the world to showcase their work, their research, their experiences, and their ideas. Because solving the complex challenges faced by vulnerable consumers, especially women, low-income, and other marginalized populations, requires us to work together and learn from one another. Because at CFI, we believe that collaboration makes all of us stronger as we tackle the difficult challenges present in the world today. This year's Financial Inclusion Week event asks the question, is inclusive finance ready for the accelerating pace of change? The future is now, but are we ready for it? What steps must be taken to responsibly embrace change and capture the benefits while mitigating significant risks? because at the center of our work are people's lives and livelihoods. We're excited to dive into a range of important topics during Financial Inclusion Week and to discuss the challenges faced by consumers, including weather-related impacts due to climate change, restrictions due to social norms, and risks due to deceptive designs, to name a few. We're also eager to examine emerging opportunities to leapfrog into the future by leveraging artificial intelligence and other digital innovations. We welcome all participants to bring your ideas, your work, and your questions to the virtual table as we work collectively to advance a more inclusive economy for all. Thank you for joining us at Financial Inclusion Week 2020. Well, um, that's great. And uh, I'd just like to quickly uh, turn to the audience uh, that is attending this session. Um, we'd love to hear where you're tuning in from. And if you can please put in the chat uh, the city, the country, and any thoughts you may have. It would be great. It would be great to see like the geographical distribution of, of our session today, and I'm sure it will continue to grow during the week. And uh, maybe as uh, the messages uh, start to trickle in, um, I'd like to share something that we are very proud of. This year, Financial Inclusion Week is the biggest ever. Every year, the platform uh, grows in terms of audience, participation, and the quality of discussion. 
And this year we received more session submissions uh, than ever before with nearly 190 uh, 90, uh, proposals submitted. These submissions are interesting because they offer us a glimpse into the primary projects and the focus areas of leading organizations in the sector. This year, it is clear that AI and climate change are top of mind for everyone in this space, along with gender, consumer protection, impact measurement, and a lot more. This year, we have 40 live sessions and 76 on-demand sessions covering all topics uh, around uh, inclusive financial services. And so with that, uh, I'm delighted to officially kick off Financial Inclusion Week 2023. And uh, to kick off this year's uh, live agenda, we wanted to hear from both experts and consumers on the most pressing issues that uh, we're facing in the inclusive finance space today. What are the consumer's pain points? What are the greatest challenges that they're facing when using financial services? What value do financial services add to their livelihoods, if any? And what do we need to do differently uh, to better support people in using these services for their livelihoods? So to set the stage for uh, this week's conversation, we pulled together a short video that highlights voices from the field and from key experts in our sector. So uh, I'd like to play that video and then we get on to a uh, uh, discussion with other colleagues. Financial Inclusion Week is an annual gathering of the global inclusive finance community to share ideas and research, concerns and opportunities. It's a time to think big and to imagine a brighter future. And with these big ideas, it's important to remember why and for whom we are working to help low income and marginalized people improve their well being, resilience, and livelihoods through financial services that are designed to meet their needs. With this in mind, we reached out to consumers and inclusive finance experts from around the world to hear what worries them, what excites them, and what is needed as we look to the future of inclusive financial services. We are living in a complicated and increasingly digital world. Low-income families have complex and often urgent financial needs. They are also the families that have the smallest margins for error. Financial tools need to work for them so that they can manage irregular income and expenses, access safety nets when they need them, and invest in their future when opportunities arise. The real risk is of a digital divide, so that we have a society in which those with access to the internet and all the power that the digital revolution brings forge ahead, leaving those who don't way behind. And we have a very bifurcated society. And I think that is a very real risk that we need to pay significant attention to. <laughs> I think they must give more opportunity or like to educate okay. because most of the people they don't know how to do the internet okay. banking. Okay. So to educate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Additionally, for many clients, there remains a lack of trust, transparency, and confidence in using financial services. And innovating to find ways to meet clients where they are continues to be a critical focus for the inclusive finance community. <laughs> Ni jihumbira ni magana tano ni binu hivi na agumu na wapi umvaneze.
na wa bi vane za ye na wa nyaha wa utunu tudu tudu pa tudu tu afisha je ba afisha ba ku afisha ra ba kavuti aha na ha mafra ku vana ku jira ha na na ya ngaku aku ni ba jira mo modoka ngo ku ba ku jira hari ya ku jira hari ya na i ku jira mo mukiri abisawa ni chigwe ne za na je na wa mjum. We can meet the moment with new innovations in digital financial services. Digital technology is bringing products to new populations, lowering costs, and bringing new levels of privacy, control, and customization to users. Usually when we think about small businesses, we're thinking about the entrepreneurs, the people who are building the small businesses, who are expanding them, who are looking for finance to invest and grow those businesses. But there are a lot of people who are attached to small businesses who are not the entrepreneurs. Those small businesses are interesting and important because they employ so many people. And yet those employees often don't have great financial possibilities. They also need financial tools to help smooth the ups and downs because their employment is often unsteady. The greatest innovation that I've seen in the past year, that's a challenging question. I think that ultimately it comes down to what is an innovation that I see that is solving some of the most pressing issues. And certainly in the African context, increased pressure on the consumer and micro entrepreneurs wallet and um, also uh, decreased access to capital have been real concerns. So for me, something that has stood out has been the emergence of Save Now, Buy Later, uh, which is an innovative digitized take on the traditional lay by product. And I think that in a time where there's a lot of talk around AI revolution, you would agree that you know access to things like smartphones is really, really critical. What I'm really interested in seeing though, I think in the next year or two is the participation of banks and mobile money operators in this space with uh, the integration of the customer experience, uh, into digital wallets, mobile money wallets, provision of trust accounts, and really providing the security that I think could scale this product in the coming years. Digital financial services, like any new technology, also generates new risks, if not designed and deployed carefully. If not designed well, digital financial services may be a double-edged sword for the poor. Donors, governments, and the private sector have the responsibility to ensure that the people they support are protected from harm and that these products truly meet their needs. The question is no longer if inclusive digital finance is relevant to our objectives of ending extreme poverty, but how. As more and more climate-related events take place that impact people's lives and livelihoods, we must increasingly turn our focus to how financial products and services can meet these new demands. And the other obvious big concern is climate change. and. This is really scaring me. We needed to start acting on this a decade ago, and now finally we're seeing some serious action on it. Los efectos del cambio climático son muy preocupantes. Lamentablemente, no solo afecta a, al ser humano, la, afecta también a lo que es la madre tierra, afecta a los cultivos. La petición que yo tuviese sería eh, implementar un seguro a lo que es la producción que nosotros tenemos, porque como le explicaba más antes, ten, tenemos mucho, muchos problemas con lo que es las inclemencias del tiempo. Pues se puede hacer un seguro, tal vez si es que se puede, o tal vez al, 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 alguna flexibilización en esa parte, claro, previo, previo ver, verificación, ¿no ve? Eh? Si es lo que yo quisiera más o menos que nos tomen en cuenta en esa parte retos más importantes para el acceso a los créditos verdes principalmente realmente no tenemos disponible principalmente en el mercado ¿verdad? que ofrece esos servicios a la población a los productores o a un grupo ¿verdad? I'd like to see our community focus more on shared accountability the idea of financial inclusion is now expanding to concepts like financial health financial resilience, well-being, well beyond the access and usage metrics that we've been used to for some time. We're now beginning to ask the question, what does responsible finance look like? Who do we expect to be responsible? Why should they be responsible? In order to get to that answer, I do think we all have to understand the role that we specifically play in contributing to inclusive finance, financial health, resilience, 
for excluded and vulnerable communities. What excites me the most is the opportunity we have to foster a new wave of progress in financial inclusion, but this time not just in access and music, but really in utility, that is in the impact financial inclusion can make for its beneficiaries. And this because we can leverage two main trends. The first one is the power of data-driven innovation, which will allow fintechs and other digital financial services to leverage the digital data trails of low-income individuals and micro firms to provide more people and firms with more and better financial services. And the second trend is the fast growth in impact and other socially-minded investment that can scale these innovations for greater impact. By shared accountability, we can all understand what the private sector is supposed to do, what the government is supposed to do, what civil society can do, and what development partners can do to help make our financial services ecosystems more responsible and better suited for the lives of those who need them the most. We're excited to tackle these issues together this week. Thank you for joining Financial Inclusion Week 2023. What a great snapshot of consumer and expert voices and an appropriate prelude, I think, to all the sessions and topics that we hope to hear this week. Um, as someone who leads research on consumer protection at CFI and thinks about responsible finance, I think there are three themes that stand out from this video, um, which I think will be reflected through this week. The first is, uh, you know, the flip side of digitalization. And uh, we've spoken about this very often. You know, we've succeeded in improving access to financial services for newer segments. We've seen rapid innovations in business models, but this doesn't seem to be sufficiently reflected in reducing consumer protection risks. On the contrary, I think digitalization has worsened information asymmetry, transparency, product unsuitability, pricing and information costs, privacy, security, fraud risk, the, the list goes on. Redress is broken, as we know, and we also run the risk, as Graham pointed out in, in the video, of creating a massive digital divide. Um, the second theme, and one that is a little less dark than the rising consumer risks theme, is the shift in focus to outcomes and impact. And I think this shift in focus will need us as an industry to address consumer protection gaps and challenges. And I hope to see a lot more innovation and investments flowing into that space. Um, and finally, in many ways, as a sector, we seem to be recognizing the need to collaborate and expand our lens beyond the traditional stakeholder groups of regulators, uh, financial service providers, consumers and users of financial services to newer actors and people who engage in the delivery and usage of financial services. Um, Jonathan referred to people engaged in small businesses beyond the entrepreneurs. I think later this week, we hope to hear about the need to engage uh, UX designers and examples of working with industry associations, reg tech developers and others. To me, this is truly a consumer protection is dead, long live consumer protection moment in that the principles of consumer protection are enduring. They continue to remain valid, but digitalization has thrown up so many different pathways to make them actionable that as an industry, I think we need to consider all of these paths to reach the positive consumer outcomes that we seek to achieve. Um, but Alex, you think of data risks and opportunities, and there's so much talk about AI today. So what do you see as the role of AI for inclusive financial services? Thanks, Jayshree. Uh, yeah, I think many of us in the community, like the rest of the world, our, our jaws collectively dropped um, with OpenAI's launch of DALI 2, and then a few months later with ChatGBT. And if you think about the scale of this, it took mobile phones about 16 years to reach 100 million users, uh, but that benchmark was cleared by ChatGBT in just over two months. And since then, and in the last year, it's just felt like a, a constant string, perhaps just on my LinkedIn feed, of announcements heralding the unprecedented, un, uh, you know, unparalleled potential of AI. But then you also have narratives on the flip side talking about uh, that AI will put us all out of work or poses some sort of existential threat. And, and it's great, I think, that the, these tools have helped elevate uh, AI in the global discourse. Um, but if you kind of center AI in financial services and inclusive finance, we've seen that applications and use cases have been growing steadily for some time. 
And these use cases are driven by what Sophie was talking about in the video in terms of greater analytic capabilities, but also the uh, unprecedented amount and explosion of consumer data trails generated by consumers and small businesses. Really that's driven itself by the growth of mobile phones and smartphone users, digital accounts, digital IDs, social media, and other data sources that are, are being integrated like satellite imagery. And of course, COVID supercharged all of this. And taken together, AI is already enabling innovations in inclusive finance by increasing efficiency, reducing costs and serving customers at scale. And in enabling higher volumes of low value transactions, AI can help make harder to reach segments more viable customers. Um, and we're already seeing this in practice, whether it's, and we'll hear from, I think, a number of our community members this week at, at Financial Inclusion Week, all kinds of fascinating use cases, um, whether it's product segmentation and customization, like Rebecca was talking about, or other innovations across digital payments, credit, and sure tech, or various support functions like chatbox. For instance, AI is already enabling fintechs to crunch uh, through machine learning models, consumer data trails with satellite data to provide crop insurance and financing for smallholder farmers. It's already enabling uh, enhanced KYC processes, helping to shorten the amount of time that it takes uh, for consumers to onboard and lower costs. At the same time, the, the complexity of these tools and the speed at which they can scale merit our attention um, and careful consideration to make sure that they're being built and used responsibly and, and not, as Graham was talking about in the video, uh, in a way that exacerbates the digital divide. And it brings up all kinds of risks as well that you, that you mentioned to Jayshree in terms of privacy, uh, bias, misinformation. So we have to keep an eye on that. Uh, at the same time, I'm confident that collectively our community's consumer centric focus and our focus on impact and outcomes will help ensure that we keep a clear eyed view of how we can continue to leverage these tools uh, to, to build inclusion. And I'm so excited about all of the great sessions and examples we'll hear about that this week. Um, so pivoting a little bit uh, to a different topic, um, uh, Eduardo, uh, one of the themes that came up in the video was uh, just the, the rapid onset of climate re related shocks and risks for consumers and was wondering from your perspective, what are some of your uh, main worries regarding weather and climate changes? Um, and do you see these changes impacting your work or, or your home or your livelihood? Thanks, Alex. Um, I think that to be very direct from a climate perspective, 2023 has probably been the worst year on record. Um, the months of July, August, September were the ho hottest ever recorded. And the damages uh, from climate uh, disasters, climate shocks of different types have been the worst in history in many countries, including in the US. Um, we've seen a range of shocks uh, from heat waves to floods, droughts that have become way more severe, way more unpredictable and common. Um, so I think something that's important to say is that you know, we shouldn't see or shouldn't think about all these events as something like bad news that are being reported by the media, but rather these are now becoming a reality that we all have to grapple with. This is a reality for us, it's a reality for people living in, in the global south, living in emerging markets, in developing markets. And something that's important to say also is that recent research um, that was conducted through Findex data and by uh, the office of the UNSGSA showed that out of the 1.4 billion people who are unbanked around the world, over a billion of them lives in the most uh, climate vulnerable countries. So clearly the link between financial inclusion and the role that financial inclusion can play in addressing uh, climate resilience, climate adaptation, is becoming absolutely a priority. And I think Graham uh, was really spot on to say that in the midst of uh, all of this uh, turmoil, the financial inclusion sector is finally trying to step up. We are probably a decade late, but finally in the last year, a couple of years, we've seen some tremendous improvements. We've seen organizations that we are all familiar with, ranging from the World Bank, CGAP, uh, UNSGSA and of course us at the Center for Financial Inclusion, we're diving deep. We're trying to figure out essentially what is the role of financial inclusion? What, what is the role of the financial sector in this evolving scenario? I think from a market perspective, 
We've started to see innovations. For example, we've seen new forms of parametric insurance against extreme heat that are very interesting, very innovative. They're being piloted, so a lot needs to be done to get to scale. We've seen uh, financing um, uh, innovations in uh, climate smart agriculture. And we've also seen cash, uh, cash transfer programs that are being redesigned to be uh, more responsive and more adequate to address uh, climate shocks. Now, having said that, while all of these innovations obviously are important that they matter, it's also becoming increasingly obvious that we cannot really uh, fintech our way out of climate change. Building climate resilience and adaptation requires us to take an extra step. We need to move beyond the business models that we are familiar with. We need to rethink and reprioritize the balance between resilience and uh, and growth, which of course continues to be very important, but that balance now is incredibly difficult for us to uh, assess. Um, we also need to rethink the role of financial inclusion beyond the individual consumers. We think about a lot of the innovations, often they direct individual consumers, individual SMEs. However, climate change requires us to take collective action and we need to understand the collective needs of communities as a whole. This is something that the sector is still grappling with, it still needs to um, uh, do where innovation is really needed. And we need a lot more work to make any significant impact. Um, and of course, let's not forget uh, about the fact that uh, the impact of climate change is not gender blind. Women are way more exposed to climate shocks. Uh, vulnerability is a lot higher uh, among women than it is among men. And in fact, on this, uh, Liz, uh, I wanted to turn to you as um, an expert on, on women's financial inclusion. I want to understand what are the, some of the challenges that women uh, face, especially in accessing or in using financial services. And from your perspective, what would help women and marginalized populations the most in our space? Thanks, Eduardo. Um, you know, many of the themes and challenges that were discussed in the video are even more relevant for women. As Eduardo just mentioned, you know, climate change will be affecting women more severely as they're more vulnerable uh, when shocks and stressors happen to them. And um, as Jay Shri noted, quoted Graham, um, there is a real um, risk of a digital divide in which uh, some are able to benefit from the power of the digital revolution and others will be left behind. With respect to financial inclusion, the risk of being left behind is much higher for women, given the gender digital divides in access to mobile phones and also the internet. Also, when it comes to consumer protection, women are more vulnerable to fraud and affected more by the lack of transparency, data misuse, and inadequate complaint mechanisms. Um, this implies that to fill consumer protection gaps, the specific issues that affect women's use of digital financial services must be addressed. As the, demo, as the video demonstrated so well, um, women often lack the confidence and the capabilities to use digital financial services. So more needs to be done to improve digital financial literacy for women, but also um, but, you know, to achieve this at scale is a huge challenge. Um, it will require that governments and the private sector work together on solutions. Um, and the, and um, going back, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, you know, one other theme that really struck me in the vi uh, in the video was that the and which was particularly pertinent for women is um, the new focus on measuring the progress of inclusive finance in terms of outcomes that are achieved, such as consumer well-being or household well-being. Um, and this is reflected in the increasing attention to women's economic empowerment as a critical outcome of financial inclusion. You know, increased privacy and control uh, over one's money are ways in which digital financial services can improve women's empowerment. Um, yet more needs to be done to improve women's economic participation and also their well-being through the use of responsible finance. Um, one of the most pressing uh, one of the most pressing needs is to continue the work that's being done to address the gendered social norms um, that block women's effective use of financial services and also hinder their economic participation. And you know more research needs to needs to be done in this area. Um, so uh, to to go on, to continue. Um, uh, Jay Shree, what, what sessions on consumer protection are you looking forward to this week? Well, oh, there's so many. There's, <laughs> there's a session at, um, I think, 1 p.m. today where uh, we the, that's going to explore the risk and 
the rise and impact of, of digitizing credit. And, you know, it looks at uh, both the positives and negative impacts of digital credit. So I really look forward to that. It's, it's led by the Gates Foundation and the Center for Effective Global Action. Um, to, there's a plug for my own session, which is uh, on the topic of deceptive designs and digital interfaces and the impact that that has on vulnerable consumers, which is at noon today. Tomorrow, I think there's a fascinating session on safeguarding women consumers in the digital revolution, which is moderated by Roshani Zafar from Kash Foundation. Uh, there's a session that's led by the Better Than Cash Alliance on the role of central banks, financial service providers, fintechs, regulators, on making recourse clear, uh, quick and responsive. And that's a session I really look forward to. Um, I can go on. There's also one on uh, that focuses on the intra and inter actor collaborations in the sector in building a responsible digital finance ecosystem. And then there's a whole host of sessions that I've bookmarked on the on-demand. So it's like walking through a candy store. Um, Alex, how about you? What excites you? So many, yeah. And there are so many bookmarked already. Um, uh, just on the topic of AI alone, um, later today, I think at 10 Eastern time, I'm so excited there's going to be a, a keynote from Chennai Chair, who's a senior program officer at Mozilla Foundation, who's just doing, Mozilla, I just think is at the forefront of all uh, you know, responsible tech. And we'll hear from her about uh, her work at Mozilla on data rights, AI ethics, um, and uh, AI's impact on society. Um, and then tomorrow, a plug for, for my session on uh, that I'll be moderating on responsible AI and inclusive finance. And we'll have participants on that from PayPal, AWS, uh, USAID, and University of California, Berkeley. Um, on Wednesday, we'll hear uh, the really fascinating work that FinReg Lab has been doing on um, AI and fair financial decisions. And we'll hear from Melissa Coide and Delisha Hand. Um, and then we'll hear on use cases from AI from a supervisory perspective. Um, and on Thursday, the, the Toronto Center is doing uh, a session. And I think also on Thursday, there's going to be a, a really fascinating session on leveraging AI for climate resilience in agriculture that is hosted by Microsave. So really so much to, to tune into. And, and also, as Jayshree said, um, plenty on demand as well. So uh Eduardo what are which sessions are you looking forward to this week or a few yeah there's a number of them obviously um let me focus on a few uh on climate which I'm particularly excited about uh, there's actually a number of them on Wednesday uh first of all there will be a live stream from the um, SAM conference um, uh, the microfinance week which is happening in um, in, in Togo it will be a session on holistic approaches to developing climate smart agriculture, something I'm really excited about. We'll connect also to the uh, conference happening there, and this is a great collaboration with them. Um, there's also a session on Wednesday uh, with CGAP and uh, Finca Impact Finance about the opportunities and challenges of providing financial services to climate vulnerable consumers. Strongly recommend that one. And then let's not forget about uh, Keynote. We have uh, Wanjira Matai from the w World Resources Institute on Wednesday, which will give us insights into her perspective on climate change and the role of financial inclusion can play. Uh, so there's, there's just, a, just a few, there's lots more, and uh, I welcome all of you to look at the, at the agenda and to bookmark the sessions that you want to attend. Uh, maybe let me pass it on to you, Liz. Uh, which sessions uh, are you particularly excited about? Well, there's lots to be excited about this week, but when it comes to women's financial inclusion, we have a few sessions I wanted to uh, point to. I'm particularly looking forward to two of the keynote presentations. Um, later today, Rosita Najmi will present on the 10-point action plan for reaching financial equality for women. Um, and on Tuesday, Greta Bull of the Gates Foundation will share her thoughts on how the sector needs to think about and tackle gender issues in inclusive finance. Other interesting sessions um, focused on this topic are uh, the gender intentionality in implementing inclusive instant payment systems in Africa, presented by Africa uh, Nenda. Uh, this panel discussion will look at how gender intentionality in inclusive instant payment systems design can address the unique needs of women and influence increased adoption of digital payments by women in general. That's on Wednesday um, at 8.30 UTC time, 4.30 a.m. Uh, EST. I will try to make it. Um, and uh, 
Finally, a plug for my own session uh, Tuesday at 8 a.m. I'll be leading a fireside chat with Astrid Devalon of the World Food Program and Manuel uh, Contreras Urbina of the World Bank. We'll hear about how to design uh, programs that transfer cash to women while safeguarding them against intimate partner violence. We'll also hear about programs to reduce the risk of gender-based violence in general. So. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a lot, obviously. Um, and uh, it's also important to say that uh, in addition to these themes and to the sessions that we talked about, there's also numerous se uh, sessions on uh, micro and small enterprises, for example, on migrants, on infrastructure, social protection, impact, and, and a lot more. Um, I'm absolutely uh, thrilled with this year's lineup of sessions uh, that touch on essentially all dimensions of inclusive finance and I believe uh, raise some of the most pressing issues that our sector faces today. Um, I look forward to learning from all of you and engaging uh, with all the content at this year's event. There's a lot happening and I really think that the value of the platform comes from interaction, from uh, discussions, from engagement with the speakers and even among the participants. Um, just as some logistics, um, all sessions are available uh, on the event platform, which is SwapCard. Um, you can browse the live agenda and bookmark the sessions that you're interested in um, and uh, uh, just bookmark and, and also view a, a wealth of on-demand sessions that are available in the, on the on-demand tab. Um, all live sessions will be recorded and made available on the platform shortly after the sessions are ended and all content um, on the platform will be available through the end of the year and will also migrate all the sessions on the CFI's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so we'll continue to share the content widely in the coming months and I welcome all of you to do the same. Uh, also note that there's a discussion tab uh, where you can share links, works, ideas, or even brainstorm with other attendees. Again, the value of the platform is really, really in the engagement and not just in the content that people share. So we really welcome all of you to use it as much as possible. And also uh, Sonia uh, Niederhammer, from uh, Graphic Harvest will be joining uh, uh, us again this year uh, with, to do live illustrations of the global live sessions. We will be posting the live draw, uh, drawings on CFI social media channels. So just be sure to be on the lookout for these very creative and illustrative summaries. Um, well, uh, just to conclude, our hope is that uh, we all walk away from Financial Inclusion Week with new ideas. Uh, inspiring examples from all over the world with new connections, people we've met, and also a renewed energy to building a more inclusive world. Um, finally, I'd like to uh, send a huge thank you to our 2023 event sponsors. Uh, our gold sponsors include Axion International, the Interledger Foundation, and UPS. Silver sponsors include uh, Axion Opportunity Fund and AXA, and also our supporters, Africa Nenda, Hilton Foundation, and the IDB Lab. Uh, sponsors, they really help us uh, keep Financial Inclusion Week uh, free uh, to attend and uh, keep the event running on an annual basis. Again, this uh, concludes our session, and I want to welcome you, all of you one more time to Financial Inclusion Week. I hope you enjoy the content uh, over the rest of the week. Thank you.